Okay, we're good to go, man. How uh, how's your afternoon going? Um, it's uh, it's okay. It's very uneventful, which is uh, actually nice. Yeah. Are you down south? Um, I'm in uh, Los Feliz, which is yeah part of Los Angeles. I um I got a copy of the uh, the book about oh about four or five days ago, and I was able to read almost the whole thing, and I really really enjoyed it. Um, and I guess I would say, um, what made you decide to, to write this now as opposed to 10 years ago or 15 years ago or whatever? Well, I had actually, um, been prodded into doing this by a, uh, a guy named Brendan Mullen, who I, uh, dedicate the book to. He's one of right. the people that I dedicate the book to just due to the fact that um, he is uh, a stud prince rocker and a hero. He's the guy that's responsible for the L.A. Uh, punk rock scene. Mm-hmm. And that is, he was the proprietor of a place called The Mask, right. which was Ground Zero, which was the uh, bomb shelter under the Pussycat Theater on Hollywood Boulevard. Yeah. Uh, for, ye- for years and years... Um, we uh, had been at each other, uh, going all the way back to Black Flag and the early days of Black Flag when we were trying to figure out ways to be able to play in clubs up in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. And being the guys that we were and looking the way that, you know, having the, having the appearance that we had, uh, we didn't fit in. And because of this, um, Brendan was like, I don't want to talk to you guys. Mm-hmm. You know, I don't blame him because of the way that we went about trying to get him to allow us to play his club. Right. Um, we eventually, um, and when I say we, uh, I had been asked to come back into Black Flag to play a couple of shows with them, and one of the shows happened to be up in San Francisco. And mm-hmm. um, that particular show... Uh, at Mabuhe Gardens is with Geza X and the Mommy Men. And Brendan Mullen is the drummer in Geza X and the Mommy Men. So after they do their sound check and black flag, I, I don't even think we did a sound check. We just loaded our gear in and it was like, time to get in the van and go somewhere. Let's do something. We're not hanging out in this neighborhood because we're going to be here once we get back. We'll be here for another eight hours or however yeah. long we're going to be there. So uh, we load in the van, and Brendan uh, kind of invites himself along, which there's nothing wrong with that. And I I would eventually learn in our little conversation in the back of the van that he didn't want to hang out with the guys in his band because he had grown tired of them just by driving up from Los Angeles to San Francisco. In the process of us hanging out in the back of the van, um, he... Uh, lets me know that he'd been a fan of Black Flag for a while, and he just mm-hmm. never had the opportunity to tell us. And he actually went so far as to say Black Flag was his favorite band of all the bands that he's dealt with, and he's dealt with the Cramps and the Dead Boys and the Dead Kennedys, and UXA, and the Alley Cats, and the Gears, and the Bags, and the Dills, and the Eyes, and X, and the Weirdos, and the Screamers, and just uh, the whole list of bands that's like, you're my favorite band. And uh, in, in this conversation, we become friends. And um, of, of course, years later, uh, and when I say years later, I'm talking probably... 20 years later, mm-hmm. um, right. he he and I uh, have an encounter at an art gallery down in uh, West L.A. And our banter and our, like, guys going back and forth and, like, how you doing and what's going on and why haven't you called me and, you know, I thought we were friends and, you know, this isn't the way that friends treat friends and all of yeah. that kind of stuff. Um, it, it spreads out onto the sidewalk, and uh, in this um, 
chattering am- amongst guys, chewing up the sidewalk, chewing on the concrete, chewing the fat. He said, mm-hmm. Keith, you've got you you you've been around long enough. You're a you're you you've survived all of this stuff. You got a bunch of stories to tell. Let's right. write a book. I'm going to help right. you get a book. I'm going to help you get a book deal. He said, these book companies, these publishers, they're not giving out a lot of money, so don't count on that. Yeah. But he said, we'll, we'll create a proposal, we'll get you a deal, and we'll write your book. And I'm just like, wow. I yeah. had been chipping away. You know, like mm-hmm. if I had a couple of hours here, three hours there, I, w- I, w- I didn't have anything else to think about. I, I would actually write stories. The problem right. with my stories is, is a story that should be eight, ten paragraphs, twelve paragraphs is normally double that because right. I talk in circles and I add a lot of fat and I use a lot of commas and parentheses and uh, it, 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 it's not uh, I'm I'm not literary and. <laughs> So Brendan's going to help me. He suffers a stroke, a massive stroke. Oh. And I I bum out like, okay, there goes my book deal, right. which was completely the wrong mentality. Mm-hmm. Like, I just lost one of my best friends. Right. Didn't that sink in? Mm-hmm. It, it, it eventually did. I mean, you know, because uh, uh, being clean and sober and, and working a program, you know, and your self cleansing and your inventory of this and bad things I've done and good things I've done and all the people I need to apologize to. Um, I hadn't uh, grabbed onto the light and um, had the understanding that, you know, you just, you just lost like one of the guiding lights of your your life. You know, you just lost one of your heroes. And it right. dawned on me and I'm I'm you know, I'm I'm speaking about him right now and his birthday was a couple of days ago and people posted his photo on the Facebook. Um so anyways I had started to write stories. I was probably what would have been six or seven chapters into a book. Right. Uh, but then my booking agent, who uh, over the years has booked any, anybody from ACDC and um, Brian Wilson and the Beach Boys to some 41 and Bad Religion and the Bad Brains and Circle mm-hmm. Jerks and Pennywise and Social Distortion and the list goes on and on and on and on, Slayer and Megadeth and all sorts of fun bands, mm-hmm. said, Keith, um, you got a little bit of spare time. I'm going to hook you up with somebody. And so I get a phone call from a, a guy on the East Coast who uh, worked in the same booking agency that uh, these guys had worked in. It it had uh, broken half and people scattered. And so the guy was on the East Coast where all of the major publishers are. You know, right. New York is... Uh, and, and I will eventually learn that these people are more ruthless than uh, Las Vegas Jewish gangsters and right. uh, the drug cartels and you know all of the backstabbing and back and forth. But uh, anyways, yeah. I get the call. The guy says, "Look, um, uh, I'm going to reach out to a couple of people. Let's get you a book deal." And I'm like, "Let's do this." Then I meet the publisher. And he introduces me to uh, Jim Ruland, who is the guy, m- my co-writer. See, mm-hmm. I could have had Jim Ruland as a ghost writer. Right. Get, shining the light on me, and I would be the guy basking in all of the glory, and it's like the book would have never got done if it was left to me and my devices. Mm-hmm. I would still be writing in circles. Right. You know, we're having this conversation, and I'm kind of talking in circles, but Jim <laughs> trimmed the fat, Jim got right to the bone, Jim got yeah. right to the meat of things, and he's the one that created the pacing, and everybody seems to love the book because it's a quick read. Yeah, I was going to say, it's pretty concise, really. It's 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 a very readable, and uh, that was that was one of the things I liked best about it, quite frankly. 
Well, um, from uh, what I've been told, it reads like one of the albums that I've uh, vocalized on, mm -hmm. which makes perfect sense. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the stories are very vivid. Like, they seem, they don't seem to, uh, you know, you read, a, uh, you, you read some of these rock star bios and they tell stories that just don't seem like they actually happened. But, like, I'm reading this, I'm thinking, oh, this seems totally, like, normal and real. And I guess, like, the first one of which was, you know, you described the organic rise of, of Black Flag and how panic was informal and not, like, this serious thing. I mean, that's so relatable. You know, it's not like you guys all of a sudden were just this juggernaut. You kind of just clipped along doing your thing for a few years. I had no idea that was the case. Well, we were, um, it was the blind leading the blind. Mm-hmm. You know, it was the 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 guy using sign language in a room filled with uh, uh, people who are blind, mm -hmm. and we just we, we we moved at our own pace. I mean, in Black Flag, that's what happened. Uh, we couldn't buy a gig, right? You know, we didn't know how to approach people at clubs and say, hey, here's a cassette of some of our songs. This is what we right. sound like. This is what we're about. We right. didn't have that wherewithal. In the Circle Jerks, it was completely different. But also, right. we kind of moved at, at our own pace. But we got caught up in a, we got caught up in a, like, hurricane, whirlwind, typhoon, uh, earthquake, forest fire of just stuff flying everywhere. Right. Because we, we uh, even though we were moving at our own pace, our clip was really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it seems like the circle jerks all of a sudden were just, you know, in it. It didn't take you guys three years to put out the first LP sort of thing. Well, also with Black Flag, we sat around uh, rehearsing quite a bit. Right. And not really talking about any kind of strategy or... Uh, did you uh, did you happen to read the first fifty pages of the punk rock manual? You know, uh, this is what you do. This right. is what you wear. This is how you behave to get from <laughs> point A to point B. Right. Yeah, we did. We didn't have that. Yeah. Well, yeah. we didn't look like that. We didn't act like that. I mean, I I I did a bunch of drunken, goofy, silly things. Mm -hmm. And I I should regret all of them, but for the most part I don't. Right. You know how how why would you regret opening a skylight in a in a a hall with eight hundred people below you and being on the roof with one of your friends and uh, unzipping your trousers and just taking a leak onto whoever the the urine fell on. <laughs> Um, oh, sorry about that. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. Okay, that's one of my amends. Yes. Yeah. I, uh, I was um, I, I was really interested in uh, Raymond, Greg's brother, as kind of the, one of the unsung heroes of the early Black Flag days. Um, and I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about Raymond and and how how he left his imprint on the scene. Well, the story that I tell of Raymond. Uh, at the Whiskey A Go Go is kind of goofy, mm -hmm. and um, I, I actually have to send him a copy of the book because mm -hmm. his his gal pal requested it, and I'm kind of uh, hoping that they get a kick out of it rather than me like pointing a finger at him and them like taking taking it the wrong way because I've yeah. actually had I've actually had a couple of couple of people. Um, one actually reached out to me and said, well, how could you say what you said about me? Oh. And uh, the other person said, well, you're a sexist uh, pig and you're an unsuccessful punk rocker and you're a low life and my girlfriend has a bookstore in Highland Park and she's not carrying your book because you're an asshole. And, okay. you know, people, uh, a lot of people that have been in my life expect to just pick up the book and uh, have me just giving glowing um, A-plus critiques and tell s great stories about them. And that's not always the case. Well, I you know, if you, get that fucked, nasty, if, you get, if you get fucked over by somebody mm -hmm. 
and and you try to sugarcoat it and make it look good, yeah, you're kind of a patsy and a sad sack and kind of pathetic. Mm-hmm. And um, so I I told the one guy, it's like, look, dude, this is what happened. I didn't I didn't make any of this up. Mm-hmm. I worked hard, and you guys showed me the door, and you bought into all of the big time rock star, uh, ultra mega superstardom bullshit, and it got you thirty thousand dollars in debt, you know. And then um, it, here, here I am, kind of talking in circles again, but uh, getting back to what you originally asked, that is, um, I tell these stories. Mm-hmm. Uh, a lot of it's for me part of my process you know right. getting this big getting this big cinder block off my chest i have a, right. a an encounter with my dad where you know i have to tell him i am bezeled about 60 70 thousand dollars and that's just yeah. a rough estimate you yeah. know and i'm thinking i'm thinking my dad's going to hate me for the rest of his life and and he looked at me and it was just one of it was probably the most enlightening moment of my life mm-hmm. where he looked at me and said you know what we're all we're all fuck ups and mm-hmm. if i were, if i were a real dad if i would have been like a real dad it wouldn't have happened right so so it's on me and it's not on you plus the business, you you worked there enough. You didn't get paid like a, a regular employee. You you earned whatever you took. Mm-hmm. So that was just for me was just like incredible. Yeah, that was one of the most moving parts of the whole book because um, uh, I I really related to that because I I got sober seven months ago. And I'm a I'm a band guy. Um, I actually play guitar in this band, Terry Maltz, that I think has had some contact with Off over the last few years. Okay. And, um, yes. And I I went on my first European tour like six months ago with Terry Maltz, uh, one month into my sobriety. And the way you were talking about, you know, jumping back into the touring circuit a month into it and making your amends and working these steps after hitting rock bottom, I really really related to that. And um, didn't you didn't yeah. you find did, uh, didn't you find like a new clarity and a new like a new lease on life and uh, uh, yeah. and, and find yourself having uh, way more energy and like you know let's do this guys yeah now it's, just, t- now it, it's time for you know I'm stepping up let's you know fucking yeah. pumping your fist going fuck yeah let's let's go. Yeah, just not feeling like shit all the time, and you know, yeah, it, it, it helps your anxiety and all this other stuff, and just yeah, I, I mean, I, I totally get what you were talking about in that chapter, especially that was that was really strong stuff in this book. That was good. Well, we need to go back to who we were originally talking about, and that's Raymond Pettibone. Yeah, yeah. He, um, he could have been like a right hand man. People, people will say Chuck the Duke was the, the heart and soul of Black Flag. Mm-hmm. Greg Ginn was the brains. Greg Ginn was the businessman. Greg Ginn had the plan. But Raymond was not only responsible for the name, but also for one of the most iconic rock images ever, and that would mm-hmm. be the four, the, the wavering four black bars that equates to a black flag and the black flag to some people means let's blow shit up let's fucking kill people let's set things on fire let's Mm -hmm. fuck up the government and for some people it just means hey you know we we'd adhered to all of these various rules throughout the years let's create some of our own rules Mm -hmm. you know and that uh equated to freedom and that's what we right. were doing. It was more about the freedom. Um, we knew that what we were doing wasn't registering um, very high on any of the meters amongst all of our friends and peers and people 
um, that surrounded us in the community that mm-hmm. wanted to hear Led Zeppelin and Doobie Brothers and Fleetwood Mac and, you know, whoever was being played on the radio, the Eagles, you know, all of that mm-hmm. kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And what we were doing, obviously, was just uh, sticking a big middle finger up in the air, saying, hey, this is who we are. This is what we're going to do. If you dig it, cool. If you don't, it's not the end of our world. But please, don't throw your half-empty quart bottle at us while we're performing. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Don't, don't, um, don't. Try to set our van on fire while it's parked in the parking lot next to <laughs> your clubhouse. Right. <laughs> you know, give us a break. And, and we're, we're, we're not that. bad people. No, we might no. play bad music, but we're not bad people. Right. And I, I, I didn't realize that Raymond's artwork was um, you would flip through it to choose what you thought worked for your band. He, he wouldn't necessarily design something for you. You would go in there and flip through it. He created the artwork, mm-hmm. and we created whatever flyers we created right. based on whatever piece we uh, chose out of his stack of artwork. Right, right. And at one point, he was so angry that he didn't want people using his artwork for flyers anymore because uh, somebody actually was taking like an original piece of art and cutting it up to make it fit their uh-huh. their their flyer rather than uh, creating your wording around whatever he had drawn. Right. You know, right. they were altering his artwork. Right. See, we, uh, and when I say we, the the, the, um, new band that I'm in, it's not that new. We've been around for about six years now. Um, Yeah. Off. I had an extremely long period of uh, any kind of inactivity with Raymond. Mm -hmm. Like we, uh, I ran into him and he was with Mike Watt at, uh, I think, the... uh, Zeros were playing at a place called the Redwood downtown LA. Mm-hmm. And uh, all of a sudden, here we are just acting like a bunch of South Bay goofballs, just a bunch of guys that had not seen each other in uh, like six years, eight years. I would occasionally uh, um, bump into them at an art exhibit or some kind of gallery showing, maybe at a club gig. But it was never, you know, when when the music's blasting, it's like you, you can't really carry on a conversation. No, no. So it's like, hey, dude, I'll call you. You know, I'll call you on Monday. Or right. I'll call you tomorrow. You know, and of course something happens and you don't get around to, or you don't have the, the guy's phone number, you don't have Raymond's phone number, you're not going to call him. I, I eventually reached out to him and said, dude, uh, where are you at? Let, let's hang. He said, "I got a, uh, I got a, uh, I'm living in a house down in Venice. Okay. And I get down there, and there is artwork everywhere. And when I say everywhere, there's stacks of it on the desk. There's stacks of it on the kitchen table. There's stacks of it next to the magazines that he uh, finds his um, inspiration from. And it's all over the floor. It's almost like you can't." walk across the floor without stepping on a $50,000 piece of artwork just (laughs) laying on the floor and there it is this just amazing piece but there's a tennis shoe a dirty tennis shoe print on it right you know how do you clean that up well you know you bust out the white out I guess yeah yeah. You know, so I'm like thinking, well, we're going to go get something to eat. We're going to continue our conversation. You know, how's your world? What's going on? Uh, any exhibits coming up? He's big over in Europe, so he does a lot of flying back and forth to Europe. Right. And I believe that him moving to New York played a big role in that. He's 
got something going on in the UK right now. When I was on tour with Flag, he had a like month long exhibit in a gallery over in Germany, over in Berlin. Um, so he's big amongst all of those people. And one of my favorite stories about him is he uh, being at one of these big ultra mega, all of the art world critics showing up for this gallery exhibit and the gallery being a, attached to a, you know, a lot of these places in Europe, they're, they're like cultural centers. So you'll have a big room that holds 1,200 people. And then you'll have a room that's the size of a club that holds 300 people. And then you'll have a room that's a gallery. And then you'll have another room that's a coffee shop pastry place. So right. he's got a thing going on in the gallery. And then he's going to do a big uh, question and answer in the room that holds a 1,000 people. And the room's filled. Everybody's sitting everywhere. They're sitting on the floor. They're sitting in front of the stage. He's up there on the podium, and all of a sudden, it's question and answer time. And all of these uh, art world people are asking him, like, all of these deep intellectual you know, what is this about, and what are you trying to say here, and what does this mean, and, oh, you're an American, and you have this black sense of humor that doesn't always translate to us Europeans over here in Belgium, and all of this wonderful shit, and all of his answers, all of his responses were baseball statistics. <laughs> That's the genius of Raymond Pettibone. Uh -huh. He is a stud prince ruler, just like right. Brendan Mullen. Right. These are, these are guys that you can put on a pedestal and not have any complaints, mm -hmm. any um, reason to point the finger and say bad things about them. Right. Uh, that's a great story. Um you know, one 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 thing that struck me in in the early portions of the book that translated throughout was um, you talk about the exclusivity uh, and kind of closed mindedness of some of the LA punk scene, but you also say it's very fat. It was very festive at times. Um, what it, what was the balance between the the kind of exclusive side and then the festive and light side? Well, you have to um, look at the uh, the 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 the. the uh, Punk Rock Ethics Committee will rear their ugly head. Right. And they'll be the ones that are shaking their fingers saying, well, you can't do this and you have to be this. You can't play with them. You can't go there. You can't charge that kind of money. Oh, you're mm -hmm. selling a T-shirt for $15, but you're supposed to be selling it for $3. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you have all of these people. In the beginning of the, the L.A. scene, there was bits and pieces of that, but they were also, um, they looked the part. You know, right. they obviously paid attention to Sid Vicious and Johnny Rotten and Dave Vanian. And, and I'm not dissing any of these guys because I love all of these guys. And, and some of us would not be doing what we're doing if it weren't for these guys. Mm -hmm. And... So all of a sudden, here's the fashion. You got to make this fashion statement, and and we weren't fashion guys. We were mm -hmm. we looked like we were wearing hand me downs, and you know we 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 made our statement uh, based on uh, wh whatever was on sale at the Goodwill, right? And so you you have these guys from the beach which would be us, mm -hmm. showing up, being surrounded by a lot of these other people. They didn't, they didn't understand or know who we were. I mean, actually, uh, in the beginning, we knew some of the girls that were going out with some of the guys in some of the bands right. because some of them were South Bay girls. But they were uh, running away from the South Bay and embracing what was going on up in Hollywood. Which, mm -hmm. That's a great thing, and they're really great people, and I love all of them, and I have nothing but great things to say about them. 
Um, so we had a little, we, we, we had a foot in the door because right. of the, knowing these gals. Right. And we would eventually um, change everybody's mind about us, minds, uh, the, the hive mind, the, the collective mind. Um, we're, we're at a party and we get a chance to throw the Nervous Breakdown EP on the turntable and everybody at the party took like three or four steps back. Like, what right. is this? Right. Um, we, we had some of our favorite people, some of the people that we looked up to, some of the people that we actually grew up with mm -hmm. happened to be in the room. Brendan Mullen being one of them. Right. Um, the, the influential uh, big players on the scene were in the room when we played. With, when the fourth song was finished, I was pulled aside by a guy named Claude Bessie, who would be uh, better known in our circles as Kick Boy, mm -hmm. who was like the, the main writer at Slash Magazine, which was very influential. Right. And he looked at me and said, you weren't supposed to make that. Yeah. Is that really you? Uh huh. And from that point on, um, everybody knew who we were, and we started to like move up in the ranks. Right. I was going to say that the, first EP is so incredible. I mean, it must have just blown people's doors off. Um, it, it looked that way in this room. People were just kind of a gasping, like, "What the fuck is this?" Yeah. Yeah. You guys made this. You know, we look like this ratty tatty, you know, like we would be at, we we would have attended Woodstock. Right. Right. You know, we're uh we would uh get in the Volkswagen van and follow the Grateful Dead wherever they went to play. <laughs> and that was Greg Ginn actually. Yeah. He's a deadhead. Notorious deadhead. And I um <clears throat> I saw a couple of Grateful Dead concerts that were uh, pretty happening. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not going to jump up and down and say, oh, they're one of my favorite bands. They're not. I got a couple of the records. I mm -hmm. pull them out every now and then. Um, you know, a, a, a great band is a great band. It doesn't matter what they look like. Yeah, you know, and I yeah. could sit here and say, well, they're so fucking cool. Everybody needs to go out and buy their entire catalog. But I'm not going to do that. I, I, I won't play that role. I pre refuse to play that role because what I... I, I I might consider great or cool might not register that way on your fucking cool coolometer. <laughs> um, you know, I was uh I was also really struck when you mentioned the band The Last. I, I had never heard of that band and I love Bomp Records. Um and I and I was listening to their first album the other night and they're fucking fantastic. And I thought it was really interesting that a band like The Last could have a, you know, kind of a, a an influence slash, you know, uh, similar path in a scene where the music is so different. I thought that was pretty cool. It's about their energy mm -hmm. and the way that they present themselves, mm -hmm. and the fact that where we were at, there were there were there were there were two original bands in the South Bay. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, at that time, we had guys like uh, Juan Crozier, who was going to play bass in Rat, mm -hmm. and we had Don Dawkin, who would mm -hmm. later go on to start a band. Like, what else would he name his band? But Don, yeah. you know, yeah. <laughs> the Don Dawkin band. Right. Dawkin, right. yeah. Um, and here are these brothers, and they... they they got if you listen to like she don't know why I'm here. That's that, that's got a kind of punk rock vibe. They, mm -hmm. they they what was interesting about them was that there was rockabilly and pop. The 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 three brothers doing like three part vocal harmonies and yeah yeah. There's keyboards and you know like '60s jangly keyboards and. You know, so they're mixing it up, and that was what was cool about them, plus the fact that they were an original band, and there was, like I said, maybe three original bands in the South Bay. Right. So they stuck out like a sore thumb. 
right. and we gravitated towards them because uh, we we all became drinking buddies, and then they would hang out at the church, and then you know it started to become this. Uh, it started to snowball from there. You know, I um when when you talk about your your time leaving Black Flag and how there was not a big incident or anything, and then you're just hanging out, and all of a sudden you kind of fall into your circle jerk bandmates almost by osmosis. You know, it it, stru- it struck me that. It was such a, you know, uh, a, uh, a special time to be playing music in that scene that that you could literally just be kind of accidentally falling into this the next great punk rock band without even knowing it, and and just an amazing time to to be alive and playing music in a, in a scene like that. It just seems like things were just happening whether you intended them to or not. Well. Um, there, none of this was premeditated. Right. And the, the thing that happened was with the circle jerks was that, that, um, some of the guys that hung out at the church had a falling out, but the guys at the church that had the falling out would be Red Cross and the McDonald brothers right. and Greg Hudson and Ron Reyes and, you know they're they're kind of they're still teenagers, mm-hmm. so they're going through all of that. You know they're s- still discovering that they're growing pubic hairs and all of that fun stuff, and they have their falling out. You know, and I I would have uh, at one point in the book I explain um, there there was a point in time when we were highly hated amongst all of our. Uh, bands that we had been a part of, right. you know, that we'd played a role in. Yeah, because years. yeah. Um we we were accused of stealing songs, mm-hmm. like just blatantly stealing songs. And I'm gonna raise my hand I'm, I'm gonna say that um I, I will as I will assume part of the responsibility for that mm-hmm. because we're in my garage and we had booked a couple of shows, and we're not writing a lot of songs. Our first album, there's 16 minutes of music, 14 minutes of music. Right. We're not writing a lot of songs. We, right. We've never, we, uh, when I say we, the Circle Jerks, have never been prolific at writing songs. Right. And I'm standing in the middle of this room surrounded by these guys, and it's like, so has anybody written anything in any of the other bands that you played in. And that's when all of this music was being volunteered, all of this music was being tossed into the the pot. And I'm right. not paying attention cuz I'm a right. fuck up. You know, I'm I want to mm-hmm. like let's rehearse and then get the fuck out of here so we can get up to Hollywood and go see some bands. You know, I need to I I I need to get up to Hollywood so I can like hook up with the coke dealer, you know, or whatever the excuse was. So right. all of a sudden, all of these riffs and and partial songs and complete songs are being tossed into the pot. Right. And like I said, I'm a I'm a I, I'm I'm fucked up out of my mind. I'm not paying attention to um, Greg taking like a complete Red Cross song and right. and, and volunteering that song. I, I, I wasn't paying attention to that. And we would eventually, I would, uh, I've uh, actually spent a lot of time with these people that were in these other bands mm-hmm. trying to um, smooth out the situation. Mm-hmm. And I'm actually friends with a lot of these people. Right. I, I I had one of the guys from the Angry Samoans. He wanted to fucking kill me. And it's like, well, wh- why? What wh- what's the deal? Right. And, and, and it's like, well, you you stole one of our songs. And I'm looking at him, and it's like, um, I've I've only heard the, the Angry Samoans a couple of times, mm-hmm. and. So I'm not that familiar with their music. I'm familiar with them as a band, and I love the Angry Samoans. Right. And he explains 
that at one point Roger played in the band. And I said, well, that explains it. Let me tell you what happened. Right. I, I I didn't purposely swipe your song, so why do you want to like punch my face in? Here, have a beer. Uh, <laughs> I got a I got a little bit of cocaine here. Take a little hoot. Right. You know, and it, <laughs> and, and and we 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 became drinking buddies and cigarette smoking buddies and pizza eating buddies and you know it was all good after that. They. Uh, I think got some kind of royalties for whatever the song was. Right. You know, and I just stopped paying attention to all of it. I was just like, I started hanging out with all of these people. I'm playing in a band with one of the guys who, uh, I, I said, so, um, you're not accusing me of stealing your song, are you? Because the, the guy that volunteered the song played in your band. Right. And I would eventually find out that when they were when 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 Greg left the band, they were breaking up. Right. And the brothers told Greg that you can use whatever we played, however you want to use it. So, anyways, um, what were we talking about? <laughs> No, <laughs> no, that was that was basically it. That was basically it. I was uh, I was gonna ask next about you know you guys didn't really tour when you were in Black Flag, but when you finally you know got it going with Circle Jerks and you got the decline you know of the West Civilization going, you kind of use that as your business card. You head back east. What were your first impressions of going back east for the first time and seeing? punk rock on the opposite coast. I mean, what what, what was that like? Um, well, we were just more blown away by the situation and the opportunity that was presented to us. Mm-hmm. Because we had a thing happen, like, I, I believe it was two or three nights before we were supposed to leave, mm-hmm. where our drummer goes he out. busted his hand, right? Well, he, like broke knuckles on both hands. Right. That, and that doesn't work for a drummer. No. You know, it might work for a vocalist. Uh-huh. Um, or like a doorman or the guy that works in the lobby of the hotel and, you know, yeah. takes everybody's luggage to wherever it needs to be taken. That doesn't yeah. work for a drummer. No. Like, are you fucking kidding? <laughs> you know, two or three nights before we're supposed to leave to right. to go out and do one of the biggest things that we've ever done. Right. And so we, um, I, I call up a friend who, who played drums in the plugs, a guy right. named Charlie Quintana, who would later go on to play with Bob Dylan. Okay. And Cracker and, um, Social Distortion, just a, like, really great guy, great drummer, totally right. happening. We had a rehearsal because he was familiar with us. He knew who we were. He'd heard our music. We, mm-hmm. uh, I, I believe we played with the plugs two or three times. So, you know, he was uh, fairly familiar. So a rehearsal. The next day we fly to New York. Um, just flying somewhere to go play music. Whole new experience. Right. You know, it didn't even matter who we were playing with. Right. It didn't even matter where we were playing. We were just going out there. You know, we got picked up at we got picked up at the airport in a limousine. It's like that's not supposed <laughs> to happen to punk rock people. That's right. not supposed to happen to people that play this kind of music. Right. You know, and then we also walk in on a uh, solidarity meeting in, at the Irving Plaza in New York, mm-hmm. which was very interesting. Uh, we also got to experience uh, a 12-year-old Harley Flanagan playing drums in the stimulators. Right. Uh, we also got to hear... 
and experience and hang out with the uh, early incarnation of the Necros. Mm-hmm. And we also got to experience the the wrath and right. zany craziness of Cheetah Chrome. Right. Play and we threat, right? also got to um, hang out with Minor Threat. Yeah. So it was a, a, a very interesting and fun, uh, fun-filled uh, whirlwind um, extended weekend, right? Kind of thing. And and didn't you, you you met John Belushi, right? I mean, I I read that and I was like, whoa, that's that's a story. Well, we met John Belushi, and he asked us if we had any singles because right. he wanted to put one in the jukebox at the the bar that he and Dan Aykroyd owned over in right. the meatpacking district. That's, inc- that's an incredible story. <laughs> well, and he also asked us if we would be interested in playing on Saturday Night Live. <laughs> you know, because at that time, the the uh, all of the actors and actresses, the performers, they were allowed to, you know, put their two cents in as to who who were the musical performers. Right. You know, on that particular night. And, you know, he was responsible for having fear in the studio. And that pretty much killed it for anybody else that John Belushi wanted on the show. Right. (laughs) Right. Damn them. (laughs) Um, So then you come back out west and, you know, you talk quite a bit about Chinatown in in the book. And uh, the scene in Chinatown also seems kind of like a special a special thing that was its own little world. Was that was that the case? Um, it was very much its own little world because um, there's a square where everybody gathers and figures out what they're going to drink, what they're going to purchase at the liquor store, who's smoking what, who's smoking who, who's got this, what drugs do you have. And uh, in the square on... on uh, one side of the square is Madame Wong's, which is pretty much uh, if you play this form of music, you don't get to play here. Right. And then you have the Hong Kong Cafe. It's right. kind of like a scene out of uh, like a Clint Eastwood, um, one of the Japanese samurai movies where on one side of the street you have one family and on the other side of the street you have another family. Right. Like for a few dollars more, a fistful of dollars, or fucking uh, Rochemont, or you know yeah. some some Japanese, some some uh, Kira Kurosawa kind of thing. This is all new wave and stuff over at one, and then punk at the other, right? Well, it was pop and and new wave and uh, like uh, roots right. music. And then at Madame Wong's, it would be a little bit new wave, but for the most part, it was punk rock. Right, right. And were these so? If you played one place, place, right? They were were they run by by actual, you know, Asian families and and business owners. um, Madame Wong's was run by Madame Wong, right? Esther Wong, and the Hong Kong Cafe was uh, owned by another Chinese family. Asian right. American family. Right. Uh, how politically incorrect am I here? No, I think I think you're just, good. Just just correct me if I'm wrong, or don't even bother good. because you know it is what it is. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you you could play one, but you couldn't play the other. Right. And occasionally the it, the the the, the uh, lines would get crossed. Right. I mean, I saw the Los Lobos and the Blasters and. Plimsolls and the bags play at Madame Wong's, right. and I believe the night that the bags played, um, Nicky Beat, who was also not only was he the drummer in the bags at one time, but he was also the drummer in the Weirdos, was uh, physically thrown down the stairs. <laughs> so wow. as we were getting ready to go in, here comes. Um, Nikki Alexander rolling down the stairs. Right. It was very comical. Yeah, so um, uh, eventually 
uh, Madame Wong's would not only have Madame Wong's East in Chinatown, but you would also have Madame Wong's West down in Santa Monica. Right. And I, I happened to uh, catch an Australian band play at Madame Wong's West, a band called the Lipstick Killers, who uh, um, originally were called the Psycho Surgeons. Okay. And they were am- amazing. There's actually uh, a live recording. Virgin Records put it out okay. of them playing at Madame Wong's. It's it's a, a board recording, right? Board to cassette. Yeah, that's cool. I, um, yeah, you, you know I, um, you know it was this time that I. It seemed like in the book you were starting to emphasize more that your lifestyle was kind of spiraling on you, and things were getting more extreme, and then you finally hit that that bottom and I mean I, I can tell you just having been sober for seven months that I still think about my you know my rock bottom my last straw I think about it every day and I'm wondering do you still you know how do you deal with your sobriety you know 30 years later I mean what is what is it like for you uh, it's actually quite easy for me mm-hmm. um, uh, a lot of people uh, I'm surrounded by a lot of program people Mm-hmm. And not non-program people, you know, people right. that aren't working any kind of a self-realization, cleansing, get to the bottom of it, uh, right. find, finding that light, finding that inner light, um, uh, cleaning up your spirituality, mm-hmm. you know, getting rid of all of that excess right. and all of that fun stuff. Being in a band, you're going to be constantly surrounded by it. Oh, yeah. It, it, it comes and it goes, and there's no way of getting around it. Um, um, what I've learned, and, and my, I believe um, what I would say is my mantra, is that I've been there, and I've, I, I've walked those streets, and I've driven in those cars, and I've hung out with those people. Mm-hmm. And it was fun. There was, it, some of it was exciting. Sometimes it was more exciting scoring the drugs than it was actually doing the drugs. Mm-hmm. A lot of it was really stupid and unnecessary and like uh, one of those, what the fuck, or are you kidding? Are you serious? Those kind of moments. Right. Um, but what I do, um, I, I've heard the stories. I've, I've seen the lives. I've seen the destruction. I've I, I've, I've risen from the rubble and cleaned myself off, dusted myself off, and it's time to get on with your badass self. Mm-hmm. Let, let, let's do this. I, I can do this now without having to do any of that other stuff. Right. I already did enough of that. I did enough of that stuff to cover for uh, 50 other people for the next 20 years. Mm-hmm. And I don't need to do it ever again. I know what it's right. like. Uh, I just I got to the point where um, I, I'd go out on a two or three day binge, mm-hmm. and it would take me two weeks to recover. And I'm, what the what the fuck? You know? Right. There you go. One of those what the fuck moments. It's like why? Yeah. Who needs that? Yeah. I know what you're saying. That's that's uh that's it's really it's really good stuff. I I was I was impressed the way you tackled it in the book and that like I said that scene with your dad, um, that was uh really well written. It, personal account, good, good, very good job. I was impressed. So thanks for that. Well, thank you for um, reading the book and paying attention. Absolutely. Well, Keith, I um I want to thank you for taking some time today because I've really enjoyed talking with you. Well, thank you for your time. You know, Absolutely. thanks for calling. Yeah. Yeah, and um I'll I'll catch you guys hopefully when you come to Sacramento uh before too long. I think you're you're stopping here on the next tour, right? Um we are at oh geez, where is it? Uh the boardwalk. The boardwalk, yeah, in Roseville. Speaking of speaking of the uh scene from the cowboy movie and the Japanese samurai movie where you have one family on one side and the clan on the other. The yeah. boardwalk looks like it could be one of the 
structures oh, yeah. on yeah, one of those streets. Yeah, it's basically a roadhouse. Yeah. Cool, Keith. Well, right on, man. Thanks again. Well, thanks for your time, Jake. All right. You have a good day. Okay, you have a good one. Cheers.